Although Stonehenge is famous as a celestial temple, archaeologists suspect a monument this big must have attracted other uses. But what? Modern forensic techniques are revealing the surprising answer. Because some of the people who came here never left. We know there are three to 400 burials in the general region. Archaeological bone expert Jackie McKinley suspects many of these people came to Stonehenge for more than just two days a year. They came to live and work, and she believes their bones can prove her theory. A lot of the time, the dead are buried in certain positions, postures, with certain materials with them. So there's a whole variety of things that I go to look for, because that can tell me something about their life, but also about Stonehenge itself. Buried beneath the stones lay human remains. Four skeletons, one decapitated. Another with fatal arrow wounds and the arrowheads that killed him. They're clues to the ancient people that came here four and a half thousand years ago. But these skeletons are not alone. Within a ring of 56 pits that surround the stones lie the cremated remains of dozens of people, and many more are buried outside this ring. What can these remains tell us about how Stonehenge was really used? Today, Jackie's examining one of the most complete skeletons found in the area. From the skeleton, I can see that this was a young adult male, probably in his mid-twenties. Dying young wasn't unusual in prehistoric Britain, but the objects buried with this man were anything but ordinary. Jackie believes they're a clue to his occupation. This is a pair of gold ornaments that were found rolled together inside the mouth. You see the tucked against the right-hand side of the, of the inner jaw, which means they were either placed in the mouth at the time of death or certainly before burial. And these really are very rare. There are only about eight pairs known from the country. Ancient people often buried their dead with possessions that hint at their owner's profession. Did this man trade in fine jewelry? We're at the very early stages of metalworking. These are very finely worked items. And to be able to have the, not just the, the technology, but the skill to have learned how to change something which was essentially a lump of rock into something that delicate and that beautifully worked would really have been seen as something quite magical. Jackie thinks this magic may have been worked by the man buried next to him. There were two graves that were within three meters of each other. The second older man was buried with the same rare gold ornaments, together with simple metalworking tools. I think he was the person who worked the magic. I think he was the person who could make those changes from pieces of rock to items of beauty and items of utility. Jackie is convinced both men were metal workers who came to Stonehenge to make and sell their precious metal goods. To her, Stonehenge was more than a monument. It was a thriving hub for craft and trade. But Jackie's discovered something even more extraordinary. These ancient craftsmen had come a long way to set up shop at Stonehenge. There are certain chemical signatures which are taken up from the groundwater, which can get fixed in the dental enamel as it's developing in the growing child. By looking at those signatures and relating them to the geology, different geologies across Europe, we can more or less work out the regions that people came from. Prehistoric Britons hadn't yet discovered the wheel, so investigators assumed they lived and died in one place. But the evidence from the older man shatters this belief. The signal that we got from him suggests he may have been from Central Europe, from the area of what we now know as Germany. 
That's a 700-mile hike from Stonehenge. The younger man's results are equally astonishing. He was born at Stonehenge, but spent his teens in Central Europe. The fact that we've been able to demonstrate that people might have moved several times in their lifetime between, you know, quite long distances is absolutely fascinating. What you've got is a, is a connection between people over a large geographic area. And whether they kept that connection because of trade or because of family, or probably a combination of the two, that is just, it is just, it's so modern in many ways. It really is very similar to what, to what we would be doing now. This discovery rewrites our understanding of the ancient world. 4,000 years ago, these two men traveled vast distances over land and sea. They were part of a complex web of connections, perhaps with the marketplace of Stonehenge at its core. And they weren't the only foreign travelers to make their way to this corner of southwest England. Evidence from hundreds of graves shows Stonehenge was a multinational melting pot. The graves are filled with items from distant lands. A green jade axe head from Italy. An amber necklace from Denmark. And blue beads from Greece. One dagger combines whale bone from as far away as Scandinavia with bronze made from Cornish tin and Welsh copper. The final and dramatic confrontation between the two houses of York and Lancaster took place on August the 22nd, 1485, in central England. This flag marks the Battle of Bosworth Field, where 15,000 men fought for the future of England. On one side was 32-year-old King Richard III, and on the other, Henry Tudor aged 28. Henry, having rallied an army of 5,000 soldiers, was still outnumbered two to one. He also knew that a victory wasn't enough. Only the death of Richard would present him as the new monarch. The engagement was fierce and bloody. Accounts tell of Richard fighting bravely and even coming within a sword's length of Henry before finally being surrounded and slain. His crown was taken from his dead body and placed on Henry Tudor's head, proclaiming him King Henry VII. His victory heralded the new dynasty of the Tudors, a 117-year reign which brought enormous change to the country as well as great wealth and power. But if the new king, Henry VII, thought he'd have a peaceful time when he came to the throne, he was mistaken. Powerful English lords control vast areas of the country from their imposing castles, which dominated the landscape. Many of these aristocratic families had had their castles and estates taken into royal hands following their defeat at the Battle of Bosworth Field. And so Henry had no shortage of enemies. Throughout his 24-year reign, there were plots, rebellions and pretenders to the throne to deal with. Executions were common. But despite these problems, Henry started what the Tudors would be good at, the concentration of power in the hands of the dynasty. He died in 1509 and was succeeded by his son, Henry VIII. And it was under Henry that England would become a more settled and united country. As a result, there was a decline of castles and the first flowering of great Tudor houses that were designed for comfort rather than defence. This can be seen at Compton Winniots in the English county of Warwickshire. 
one of the first great Tudor houses. It was built by William Compton, a boyhood friend of Henry VIII, who gave him an old nearby castle. William tore it down and incorporated much of the original in his new house, which is how it kept a castle look. The roof line has a Tudor trademark that can be seen on countless houses throughout the period. Fantastic chimneys in all shapes, sizes and designs. King Henry VIII stayed many times at Compton Winniards and his bedroom window still has the King's coat of arms in stained glass. But there was one house being built that was so opulent and audacious that it even made the King envious. A house that was to be the new home of his eminence, Cardinal Wolsey. After Henry VIII, he was the most powerful man in the land and the King's closest advisor. As a result, he was able, through patronage and corruption, to become immensely rich and build one of the grandest palaces ever seen in England, Hampton Court. In this enormous house, he could entertain on a lavish scale. It rivalled Henry's court and it angered the king. Wolsey's eventual downfall came when he failed to persuade the Pope in Rome to grant Henry a divorce from his first wife because she couldn't present him with a son. As he felt power slipping from his hands, Wolsey offered the king his house. Henry took it and eventually had Wolsey arrested, but he died before Henry could execute him. The woman who Henry desired and wanted to marry was Anne Boleyn. She was to become the second of Henry's six wives and the mother of the future Queen Elizabeth I. It's likely she was born here at Blickling Hall in the east of England. Anne's eventual marriage to the king had been engineered by her family and powerful friends, who stood to gain from her becoming queen. They had seen how Henry looked at her and increasingly desired her. This relationship was to cause one of the biggest upheavals in English history, the break with the Pope in Rome and a new English religion. But marriage to Henry was to eventually cost Anne Boleyn her head, when, like his first wife, she failed to present the king with a son. In London, she was tried for adultery, incest and treason and executed here at the Tower of London. Blindfolded and kneeling upright in the French manner, the executioner shouted, Where's my sword? to distract her, and then severed her head in one blow. These are the ruins of Fountains Abbey in the north of England. It's not ruined through neglect, but because Henry VIII ordered its destruction. When Henry sought a divorce in order to marry Anne Boleyn, he was refused by the powerful Catholic Church. When, in a defiant act, the marriage went ahead, the Pope in Rome excommunicated Henry, such that his soul would be condemned to hell. The result was a bitter confrontation between Henry and the Roman Catholic Church. Henry saw his opportunity to take all the church treasure. In 1539, the king's men approached Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire and forcibly looted the monastery and then left the buildings to demolition gangs. <laughs> 